This is going to be a recording of John Calvin's letter to Cardinal Sadaletto, which was has been said to be one of the most important doctrine, uh, documents during the Protestant Reformation. And I'd always wanted to read it, and I still hadn't. It had remained an open tab on my phone for probably a year now. So in order to make myself read it, I'm going to read it into this program so that I can put it on YouTube, because I don't believe there's a YouTube video yet that has it. So... It was written in 1539, and I'm going to read the little introduction that comes from monergism.com, which is where I'm getting this. It says, After Calvin's expulsion from Geneva in 1538, the Archbishop of Carpentras in southern France, near Avignon, about as far from Geneva as Strasbourg was, but in the other direction, wrote to the Genevan people in an effort to persuade them to return to Roman Catholicism. Sadoletto's letter is notable in that it frankly acknowledged the abuses and corruptions most frequently attacked by Protestants and other Reformers. He argued that nevertheless authentic Christian faith was still best sought under the cloak of the Holy Mother Church. In spite of having expelled Calvin from the town, the Genevans nonetheless requested that Calvin respond to Sadoletto's tract, and soon afterwards the city government ordered that the response be printed and publicized. Calvin's reply, a powerful defense of the need for reform, sought to explain that Protestant reform was not simply response to abuses in the church, but to a rejection of the very heart of Catholic faith and practice. And here is the letter. John Calvin to James Sadolet, Cardinal. Health. In the great abundance of learned men whom our age has produced, your excellent learning and distinguished eloquence, having deservedly procured you a place among the few whom all who would be thought studious of liberal arts, look up to and revere. It is with great reluctance I bring forward your name f before the learned world and address to you the following expostulation. Nor indeed would I have done it if I had not been dragged into this arena by a strong necessity, for I am not unaware how, uh, how reprehensible it would be to show any eagerness in attacking a man who has deserved so well of literature, nor how odious I should become to all the learned were they to see me stimulated by passion merely, and not impelled by any just cause, turning my pen against one whom, for his admirable endowments, they, not without good reason, deem worthy of love and honor. I trust, however, that after explaining the nature of my undertaking, I shall not only be exempted from all blame, but there will not be an individual who will not admit that the cause which I have undertaken I could not on any account have abandoned without basely deserting my duty. You lately addressed a letter to the Senate and people of Geneva, in which you sounded their inclination as to whether, after having once shaken off the yoke of the Roman pontiff, they would submit to it again imposed on them. In that letter it as it was not expedient to the wound, to wound the feelings of these whose favor you required to gain your cause, you acted the part of a good pleader. For you endeavored to soothe them by abundance of flattery, in order that you might gain them over to your views. Thing of obloquy and bitterness you directed against those whose exertions had produced the revolt from that tyranny. And here, so help you, you bear down full sail upon those who, under pretense of the gospel, have by wicked arts urged on the city to what you deplore as the subversion of religion and of the church. I, however, Sadolet, profess to be one of those whom with so much enmity you assail and stigmatize. For though religion was already established, and the form of the church corrected, before I was invited to Geneva, Yet having not only approved of my su by my suffrage, but studied as much as in me lay to preserve and confirm what had been done by Veray and Farrell, I cannot separate my case from theirs. Still, if you had attacked me in my private character, I could, have easily for I could easily have forgiven the attack in consideration of your learning and in honor of your letters. But when I see that my ministry, which I feel assured is supported and sanctioned by a call from God, is wounded through my side, it would be perfidy, not patience, were I here to be silent and connive. In that church I have held the office first of doctor and then of pastor. In my own right, I maintain, 
that in undertaking these offices I had a legitimate vocation. How faithfully and religiously I have performed them, there is no occasion for now showing at length. Perspic perspicuity, erudition, prudence, ability, not even industry, will I now claim for myself. But that I certainly labored with the sincerity which became me in the work of the Lord. I can in conscience appeal to Christ, my judge, and all his angels, while all good men bear clear testimony in my favor. This ministry, therefore, when it shall appear to have been of God, as it certainly shall appear, after the cause has been heard, were I in silence to allow you to tear and defame, who would not, con who would not condemn such silence as treachery? Every person, therefore, now sees that the strongest obligations of duty, obligations which I cannot evade, constrain me to meet your accusations, if I would not with manifest perfidy desert and betray a cause with which the Lord has entrusted me. For though I am for the present relieved of the charge of the Church of Geneva, that circumstance ought not to pre prevent me from embracing it with paternal affection. God, when he gave it to me in charge, having bound me to be faithful to it forever. Now then, when I see the worst snares laid for that church, whose safety it has pleased the Lord to make my highest care and grievous peril impending if not obviated, who will advise me to await the issue silent and unconcerned? How heartless, I ask, would it be to wink in idleness, and, as it were, vacillating at the destruction of one whose life you are bound vigilantly to guard and preserve? But more on this point were super superfluous, since you yourself relieve me of all difficulty. For if neighborhood, and that not very near, has weighed so much with you, that while wishing to profess your love towards the Genevans, you hesitate not so bitterly to assail me and my fame, it will undoubtedly, by the law of humanity, be conceded to me, while desiring to consult for the public good of a city entrusted to me by a far stronger obligation than that of neighborhood, to oppose your counsels and endeavors, which I cannot doubt tend to its destruction. Besides, without paying the least regard to the Genevan church, though assuredly I cannot cut off that charge any more than that of my own soul, supposing I were not actuated by any zeal for it, still, when my ministry, which, knowing it to be from Christ, I am bound, if need be, to maintain with my blood, is assailed and falsely traduced, how can it be lawful for me to bear it as if I saw it not? Wherefore, it is easy not only for impartial readers to judge, but for yourself also, Sadolet, to consider how numerous and valid the reasons are which have compelled me to engage in this contest, if the name of contest should be given to a simple and dispassionate defense of my innocence against your cal calumnious accusations. I say my innocence, although I cannot plead for myself without, at the same time, including my colleagues, with whom all my measures in that administration were so conjoined, that whatever has been against them I will willingly take to myself. What the feelings are which I have had toward yourself in undertaking this cause, I will study to testify and prove by my mode of conducting it. For I will act so, that all may perceive that I have not only greatly the advantage of you in the goodness and justice of the cause, in conscientious rectitude, heartfelt sincerity, and candor of speech, but have also been considerably more successful in maintaining gentleness and moderation. There will doubtless be some things which will sting, or it may be stag speak daggers to your mind, but it will be but it will be my endeavor first not to allow any harsher expression to escape me than either the injustice of the accusations with which you have previously assailed me or the necessity of the cue may extort and secondly, not to allow any degree of harshness which may amount to intemperance or passion, or which may, by its appearance of petulance, give offense to, to ingenuous minds. And first, if you had to do with any other person, he would undoubtedly begin with the very arguments, argument which I have determined altogether to omit. For, without much ado, he would discuss your design in writing, until he should make it plain that your object was anything but what you profess it to be. For were it not for the great credit you formerly acquired for candor, it is somewhat suspicious that a stranger who never before had any intercourse with the Genevans 
should now suddenly profess for them so great an affection, though no previous sign of it existed, while, as one imbued almost from a boy with Romish arts, such arts as am now learned in the court of Rome, that forge of all craft and trickery, educated, too, in the very bosom of Clement, and now, moreover, elected a cardinal, you have many things about you which, with most men, would in this matter subject you to suspicion. Then as to those insinuations by which you have supposed you might win your way into the minds of simple men, any one, not utterly stupid, might easily refute them. But things of this nature, though many will, perhaps, be disposed to believe them, I am unwilling to ascribe to you, because they seem to me unsuitable to the character of one who has been polished by all kinds of liberal learning. I will, therefore, in entering into discussion with you, give you credit for having written to the Genevans with the purest intention, as becomes one of your learning, prudence, and gravity, and for having, in good faith, advised them to the course which you believed conducive to their interest and safety. But whatever may have been your intention, I am unwilling, in this matter, to charge you with anything invidious, when, with the bitterest and most contumelious expressions which you can employ, you distort and endeavor utterly to destroy what the Lord delivered by our hands. I am compelled, whether I will or not, to withstand you openly. For then only do pastors edify the church, when, besides leading docile souls to Christ, placidly as with the hand, they are also armed to repel the machinations of those who strive to impede the work of God. Although your letter has many windings, its whole purport, substantially, is to recover the Genevans to the power of the Roman pontiff, or to what you call the faith and obedience of the church. But as, from the nature of the case, their feelings required to be, so to be softened, you preface with a long oration concerning the incomparable value of eternal life. You afterwards come nearer to the point when you show that there is nothing more pestiferous to souls than a, per than a perverse worship of God, and again, that the best rule for the due worship of God is that which is prescribed by the church, and that, therefore, is no there is no salvation for those who have violated the unity of the church unless they repent. But you next contend that separation from your fellowship is manifest revolt from the church, and then that the gospel which the Genevans received from us is nothing but a large farrago of impious dogmas. From this you infer what kind of divine judgment awaits them if they attend not to your admonitions. But as it was of the greatest importance to your cause to throw complete discredit on our words, you labor to the utmost to fill them with sinister suspicions of the, real, of the zeal which they saw us manifest for their salvation. Accordingly, you captiously allege that we had no other end in view than to gratify our avarice and ambition. Since then, your device has been to cast some stain upon us, in order that the minds of your readers, being preoccupied with hatred, might give us no credit. I will, before proceeding to other matters, briefly reply to that objection. I am unwilling to speak of myself, but since you do not permit me to be altogether silent, Say what I can, consistent with modesty. Had I wished to consult my own interest, I would never have left your party. I will not indeed boast that there, that there the road to preferment had been easy to me. I never desired it, and I could never bring my mind to catch at it, although I certainly know not a few of my own age who have crept up to some eminence, among them some whom I, have, whom I might have equaled, and others outstripped. This only I will be contented to say. It would not have been difficult for me to reach the summit of my wishes, viz. the enjoyment of literary ease with something of a free and honorable station. Therefore, I have no fear that any one not possessed of shameless effrontery will object to me that out of the kingdom of the Pope I sought for any personal advantage which was not there ready to my hand. And who dare object to this feral? Had it been necessary for him to live by his own industry, he had already made attainments in literature, which would not have allowed him to suffer want, and he was of a more distinguished family than to require external aid. As to those of us whom you pointed as with the finger, it seemed proper for us to reply in our own name. 
But since you seem to throw out indirect insinuations against all who in the present day are united with us in sustaining the same cause, I would have you understand that not one can be mentioned for whom I cannot give you a better answer than for Farrell and myself. Some of our reformers are known to you by fame. As to them, I appeal to your own conscience. Think you it was... Think you it was hunger which drove them away from you, and made them in despair flee to that change as a means of bettering their fortunes? But not to go over a long catalogue, this I say, that of those who first engaged in this cause, there was none who with you might not have been in better place and fortune than require on such grounds to look out for some new plan of life." And I probably shouldn't add any of my own commentary here because it's not really worth much and it might annoy some, so I apologize. But for my own thoughts and for those whose minds tend to wander when listening to YouTube videos, basically that whole section is just saying, as for me and the people that you criticize, if you're trying to convince the Genevan people that we're only doing it because we can get something out of you, we can get something from you, whether it be fame, whether it be money, um, there are plenty of reasons that Calvin can give for himself as well as other leaders in the Reformation to show that they were in no need of money or fame and that they could have done quite well, thank you very much, if they had stayed within the Roman Catholic Church, um, if they were only seeking you know, a good reputation from men or an easy life, they would have just stayed where they were. There is clearly nothing for them by in the way of just selfishness to go to Geneva and, and be with this small band of reformers that are just, you know, magnets for trouble, basically. So he's saying, you know, that that accusation from Satellite is ridiculous. Okay, I'll move on. But come and consider with me for a little while what the honors and powers are which we have gained. All our bearers will bear uh, all our bearers will bear us witness that we did not covet or aspire to any other riches or dignities than than those which fell to our lot since in all our words and deeds they not only perceived no trace of the ambition with which you charge us but on the contrary saw clear evidence of our abhorring it with our whole heart you cannot hope that by one little word their minds are to be so fascinated as to credit a futile slander in opposition to the many certain proofs with which we have furnished them, and to appeal to facts rather than words, the power of the sword, and other parts of civil jurisdiction which bishops and priests under the semblance of immunity had wrestled from the magistrate and claimed for themselves, have not we restored to the magistrate? All their usurped instruments of tyranny and ambition have we not detested and struggled to abolish? If there was any hope of rising, why did we not craftily dissemble so that those powers might have passed to us along with the office of governing the church? And why did we make such exertion to overturn the whole of that dominion, or rather butchery, which they exercised upon souls without any sanction from the word of God? How did we not consider that it was just so much lost to ourselves? In regard to ecclesiastical revenues, they are still in a great measure swallowed up by these whirlpools. But if there was a hope that they will one day be deprived of them, as at length they certainly must, why did we not devise a way by which they might come to us? But when with clear voice we denounced as a thief any bishop who, out of ecclesiastical revenues, appropriated more to his own use than was necessary for a frugal and so sober subsistence, when we protested that the church was exposed to a deadly poison so long as pastors were loaded with an affluence which, under which they themselves might ultimately sink, when we declared it inexpedient that these revenues should fall into their possession, finally when we counseled that as much should be distributed to ministers as might suffice for a frugality befitting their order, not superabound for luxury, and that the rest should be dispensed according to the practice of the ancient church, when we showed that men of weight ought to be elected to manage these revenues under an obligation to account annually to the church and the magistracy, was this to entrap any of these for ourselves, or was it not rather voluntarily to shake ourselves free of them? 
All these things, indeed, demonstrate not what we are, but what we wished to be. But if these things are so plainly and generally known, that not one iota can be denied, with what face can you proceed to upbraid us with aspiring to extraordinary wealth and power, and this especially in the presence of men to whom none of those things are unknown? The monstrous lies which persons of your order spread against us among their own followers we are not surprised at, for no man is present who can either reprimand or venture to refute them, but where men have been eyewitnesses of all the things which we have above mentioned, to try to persuade them of the contrary is the part of a man of little discretion, and strongly derogates from Sadaletto's reputation for learning, prudence, and gravity. But if you think that our intention must be judged by the result, it will be found that the only thing we aimed at you, that we aimed at was, that the kingdom of Christ might be promoted by our poverty and insignificance. So far are we from having abused his sacred name to purposes of ambition. So basically that entire paragraph or section was just calling them hypocrites. He's like, not only, Sadaletto, do you accuse us of having purposes of ambition, but talk about the pot calling the kettle black. Okay. I pass in silence many other invectives which you thunder out against us, open-mouthed, you call us crafty men, enemies of Christian unity and peace, innovators on things ancient and well-established, seditious, alike pestiferous to souls, and destructive both publicly and privately to society at large. Had you wished to escape rebuke, you either ought not, for the purpose of exciting prejudice, attributed to us a magniloquent tongue, or you ought to have kept your own magniloquence considerably more under check. I am unwilling, however, to dwell on each of these points. Only I would have you to consider how unbecoming, not to say illiberal, it is, thus in many words to accuse the innocent of things, which by one word can be instantly refuted, although to inflict injury on man is a small matter when compared to the indignity of that con contumely, which, when you come to the question, you offer to Christ and his word." When the Genevans, instructed by our preaching, escaped from the gulf of error in which they were immersed, and betook themselves to a purer teaching of the gospel, you call it defection from the truth of God, when they threw off the tyranny of the Roman pontiff, in order that they might establish among themselves a better form of church. You call it a desertion from the church. Come then, and let us discuss both points in their order." As to your preface, which in proclaiming the excellence of eternal blessedness occupies about a third part of your letter, it cannot be necessary for me to dwell long in reply. For although commendation of the future and eternal life is a theme which d deserves to be sounded in our ears by day and by night, to be constantly kept in remembrance and made the subject of ceaseless meditation, Yet I know not for what reason you have so spun out your discourse upon it here, unless it were to recommend yourself by giving some indication of religious feeling. But whether in order to remove all doubt concerning yourself, you wished to testify that a life of glory seriously occupies your thoughts, or whether you supposed that those to whom you wrote required to be excited and spurred on by a long commendation of it, for I am unwilling to divine what your intention may have been, it is not very sound theology to confine a man's thoughts so much to himself and not to set before him as the prime motive of his existence, zeal to illustrate the glory of God. For we are born first of all for God and not for ourselves. As all things flowed from him and subsist in him, so says Paul, Romans 11.36, they ought to be referred to him. I acknowledge indeed that the Lord the better to recommend the glory of his name to men, has tempered zeal for the promotion and extension of it by uniting it indissolubly with our salvation. But since he has taught that this zeal ought to exceed all thought and care for our own good and advantage, and since natural equity also teaches that God does not receive what is his own, unless he is preferred to all things, it certainly is the part of a Christian man to ascend higher than merely to seek and secure the salvation of his own soul. I am persuaded, therefore, that there is no man imbued with true piety 
who will not consider as insipid that long and labored exhortation to zeal for heavenly life, a zeal which keeps a man entirely devoted to himself and does not, even by one expression, arouse him to sanctify the name of God. But I readily agree with you that, after this sanctification, we ought not to purpose to ourselves any other object in life than to hasten towards that high calling. For God has set it before us as the constant aim of all our thoughts and words and actions. And indeed, there is nothing in which man excels, the lower animals, unless it be his spiritual communion with God, in the hope of a blessed eternity. And generally, all we aim at in our discuss discourses is to arouse men to meditate upon it and aspire to it. I have also no difficulty in conceding to you that there is nothing more perilous to our salvation than a preposterous and perverse worship of God. The primary rudiments by which we are wont to train to piety, those whom we wish to gain as disciples to Christ, are these. These uh, not to frame any new worship of God for themselves at random, and after their own pleasure, but to know that the only legitimate worship is that which he himself approved from the beginning. For we maintain what the sacred oracle declared, that obedience is more excellent than any sacrifice. 1 Samuel 15.22 In short, we train them by every means to be contented with the one rule of worship which they have received from his mouth and bid adieu to all to fictitious worship. Therefore, Sadolet, when you uttered this voluntary confession, you laid the foundation of my defense. For if you admit it to be a fearful destruction to the soul, when, by false opinions, divine truth is turned into a lie, it now only remains for us to inquire which of the two parties retains that worship of God, which is alone legitimate. In order that you may claim it for your party, you assume that the most certain rule of worship is that which is prescribed by the church. Although, as if we here opposed you, you bring the matter under consideration in the manner which is usually observed in regard to doubtful questions. But, Sadolet, as I see you toiling in vain, I will relieve you from all trouble on this head. You are mistaken in supposing that we desire to head away the people from that method of worshiping God which the Catholic Church always observed. You either labor under a delusion as to the term church, or at least knowingly and willingly give it a gloss. I will immediately show the latter to be the case, though it may also be that you are somewhat in error. First, in defining the term, you omit what would have helped you, and in, in no small degree, to the right understanding of it. When you describe it as that which in all parts, as well as at the present time, in every region of the earth, being united and consenting in Christ, has been always and everywhere directed by the one Spirit of Christ, what comes of the word of the Lord, that clearest of all marks, and which the Lord himself, in pointing out the church, so often recommends to us? Foreseeing how dangerous it would be to boast of the Spirit without the word, he declared that the church is indeed governed by the Holy Spirit, but in order that the government might not be vague and unstable, he annexed it to the word. For this reason Christ exclaims that those who are of God hear the word of God, that his sheep are those which recognize his voice as that of their shepherd, and any other voice as that of a stranger. John 10.27 For this reason the Spirit, by the mouth of Paul, declares, Ephesians 2.20, that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Also, that the church is made holy to the Lord by the washing of water in the word of life. The same thing is declared still more clearly by the mouth of Peter, when he teaches that people are regenerated to God by that incorruptible seed. 1 Peter 1, 23. In short, why is the preaching of the gospel so often styled the kingdom of God, but because it is the scepter by which the heavenly king rules his people. You find this in the apostolic writings only, but whenever the prophets foretell, foretell the renewal of the church or its extension over the whole globe, they always assign the first place to the word. For they tell that from Jerusalem will, this, will issue forth living waters, which being divided into four rivers will inundate the whole earth. 
Zechariah 14.8. And what these living waters are, they themselves ex explain when they say, that the law will come forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, Isaiah 2.3. Well then, does Chrysostom admonish us to reject all who, under the pre pretense of the Spirit, lead us away from the simple doctrine of the gospel, the Spirit having been promised not to reveal a new doctrine, but to impress the truth of the gospel on our minds? And we, in fact, experience in the present day how necessary the admonition was. We are assailed by two sects, which seem to differ most widely from each other. For what similitude is there in appearance between the Pope and the Anabaptists? And yet, that you may see that Satan never transforms himself so cunningly as not in some measure to betray himself, the principal weapon with which they both assail us is the same. For when they boast extravagantly of the Spirit, the tendency certainly is to sink and bury the Word of God that they may make room for their own falsehoods. And you, Sadalet, by stumbling on the very threshold, have paid the penalty of that affront which you offered to the Holy Spirit when you separated him from the word. For as if those who seek the way of God were standing where two ways meet and destitute of any certain sign, you are forced to introduce them as hesitating whether it be more expedient to follow the authority of the church or to listen to those whom you call the inventors of new dogmas. Had you known or been unwilling to disguise the fact that the Spirit goes before the Church to enlighten her in understanding the Word, while the Word itself is like the Lydian stone by which she tests all doctrines, would you have taken refuge in that most perplexing and thorny question? Learn then by your own experience that it is no less unreasonable to boast of the Spirit without the Word then it would be absurd to bring forward the word itself without the spirit. Now, if you can bear to receive a truer definition of the church than your own, say, in future, that it is the society of all the saints, a society which, spread over the whole world and existing in all ages, yet bound together by the one doctrine and the spirit of Christ, cultivates and observes unity of faith and brotherly concord, with this church we deny that we have any disagreement. Rather, as we revere her as our mother, so we desire to remain in her bosom. But here you bring a charge against us. For you teach that all which has been approved for 1,500 years or more by the uniform consent of the faithful is, by our head's strong rashness, torn up and destroyed. Here I will not require you to deal truly and candidly by us though this should be spontaneously offered by a philosopher, not to say a Christian. I will only ask you not to stoop to an illiberal indulgence in calumny, which, even though we be silent, must be extremely injurious to your reputation with grave and honest men. You know, Satellite, and if you venture to deny, I will make it palpable to all that knew you knew, yet cunningly and craftily disguise the fact, not only that our agreement with antiquity is far closer than yours, but that all we have attempted has been to renew the, that ancient form of the church, which at first sullied and distorted by illiterate men of indifferent character, was afterwards flagitiously mangled and almost destroyed by the Roman pontiff and his faction. I will not press you so closely as to call you back to that form which the apostles instituted, though in it we have the only model of a true church, and whosoever deviates from it in the smallest degree is in error. But to indulge you, so for, indulge you so for place, I pray, before your eyes, that ancient form of the church, such as their writings prove it to have been in the age of Chrysostom and Basil among the Greeks, and of Cyprian, Ambrose, and Augustine among the Latins. After so doing, contemplate the ruins of that church, and now surviving among yourselves. Assuredly, the difference will appear as great as that which the prophets describe between the famous church which flourished under David and Solomon and that which under Zedekiah and Jehoiakim had lapsed into every kind of superstition and utterly vitiated the purity of divine worship. Will you here give the name of an enemy of antiquity to him who, zealous for ancient piety and holiness and dissatisfied with the state of matters as existing in a dissolute, and depraved church, attempts to ameliorate its condition and restore it to pristine splendor? 
Since there are three things on which the safety of the church is founded, these doctrine, discipline, and the sacraments, and to these a fourth is added, these ceremony, ceremonies, by which to exercise the people in offices of piety, in order that we may be most sparing of the honor of your church, by which of these things would you have us to judge her? The truth of prophetical and evangelical doctrine on which the church ought to be founded has not only in a great measure perished in your church, but is violently driven away by fire and sword. Will you obtrude upon me for the church a body which furiously persecutes everything sanctioned by our religion, both as delivered by the oracles of God and embodied in the writings of holy fathers and approved by ancient councils? Where, pray, exist you among... Where, pray, exist among you any vestiges of that true and holy discipline which the ancient bishops exercised in the church? Have you not scorned all their institutions? Have you not trampled all the canons underfoot? Then your nefarious profanation of the sacraments I cannot think of without the utmost horror. Of ceremonies, indeed, you have more than enough, but for the most part so childish in their import and vitiated by innumerable forms of superstition as to be utterly unavailing for the preservation of the church. None of these things, you must be aware, is exaggerated by me in a captious spirit. They all appear so openly that they may be pointed out with the finger wherever th there are eyes to behold them. Now, if you please, test us in the same way. You will assuredly fall far short of making the charges which you have brought against us. In the sacraments, all we have attempted is to restore the native purity from which they had degenerated, and so, in, and so enable them to resume their dignity. Ceremonies we have had in a great measure abolished. But we were compelled to do so partly because by their multitude they had degenerated into a kind of Judaism, partly because they had filled the minds of the people with superstition and could not possibly remain without doing the greatest injury to the piety which it was their office to promote. Still, we have retained those which seemed sufficient for the circumstance of the times. That our discipline is not such as the ancient church professed, we do not deny. But with what fairness is a charge of, of subverting discipline brought against us by those who themselves have utterly abolished it, and in our attempts to reinstate it in its rights have hitherto opposed us? As to our doctrine, we hesitate not to appeal to the ancient church, and since, for the sake of example, you have touched on certain heads, as to which you thought you had some ground for accusing us, I will briefly show how unfairly and falsely you allege that these are things which have been devised by us against the opinion of the Church. Before descending to particulars, however, I have already cautioned you, and would have you again and again consider with what reason you can charge it upon our people as a fault, that that they have studied to explain the scriptures. For you are aware that by this study they have thrown such light on the word of God that in this respect even envy herself is ashamed to defraud them of all praise. You are just as uncandid when you aver that we have seduced the people by thorny and subtle questions and so entice them by that philosophy of which Paul bids Christians beware. What? Do you remember what kind of time it was when our reformers appeared and what kind of doctrine candidates for the ministry learned in the schools? You yourself know that it was mere sophistry and sophistry so twisted, involved, torturous, and puzzling that scholastic theology might well be described as a species of secret magic. The denser the darkness in which anyone shrouded a subject, the more he puzzled himself and others with preposterous riddles, the greater his fame for acumen and learning. And when those who had been formed in that forge wished to carry the fruit of their learning to the people, with what skill, I ask, did they edify the church? Not to go over every point, what sermons in Europe then exhibited that its simplicity with which Paul wishes a Christian people to be always occupied? Nay, what one sermon was there from which old wives might not carry off more whimsies than they could devise at their own fireside in a month? For as sermons were then usually divided, 
The first half was devoted to those misty questions of the schools with, which might admo- astonish the rude populace, while the second contained sweet stories or not unamusing speculations by which the hearers might be kept on the alert. Only a few expressions were thrown in from the word of God, that by their majesty they might procure credit for these frivolities. But as soon as our reformers raised the standard, all these absurdities in one moment disappeared from amongst us. Your preachers again partly profited from our books, and partly compelled by shame and the general murmur conformed to our example, though they still, with open throat, exhale the, uh, the old, exhale the old absurdity. Hence, anyone who compares our method of procedure with the old method, or with that which is still in repute among you, will perceive that you have done us no small injustice. But had you continued your quotation from Paul a little, farther, any boy who, any boy would easily have perceived that the charge which you bring against us is undoubtedly applicable to yourselves. For Paul there interprets, quote, vain philosophy, Colossians 2.8, to mean that which preys upon pious souls, by means of the constitutions of men and the elements of this world, and by these you have ruined the church.